Hey everybody, welcome to Weekly Tax Update with yours truly. This is episode 78 for July 21st, 2023. Be sure to stay until the very end. We have a new segment we're starting this week. I think you folks are going to love it. Thank you all for taking time to tune in this week. This should be a great program, in fact, a supersized edition because we didn't have the program last week while we let our colleague, Mr. Reynolds, come in. As you know, we're running a monthly theme each month. <clears throat> Our, uh, just about done with the July theme of tax planning and investments, and we're going to be rolling out the real estate theme for the month of August. There's room still in the tax practice support program if you find yourself needing help, if you find that you're a small practice and you need that person to bounce things off of, that place to ask a question, that place to get a solid answer. Uh, please, monthly program, uh, there's some seats available. You could join me and Ellie. Uh, I'm getting comments here about the echo. Um, I, I can't go out and come in. Um, Everybody hold on a moment. Okay, so it looks like John did decide to exit and come back in, hoping that the audio is clearer. So maybe I will continue his um, slides here until he joins us. So I'll pick up where he left off. Um, there are a few seats available, not many, in the 2023 Tax Practice Support Program. Uh, in the off-season, we meet once a week, 1 p.m. Eastern Time on Friday, so right before this session. Uh, and then during the tax season, of course, it increases to twice a week. Um, so you're welcome to join us for tax practice support. We answer all kinds of questions. Um, oh, I'm so sorry, Sabrina. Hopefully my audio is right and John's was just wrong. Um, it might, you know what it might have been? Um, as I, I updated Chrome again, but when I came back into the room, it was defaulting to the little bitty camera to the little bitty microphone that's on this camera so now we now the yeti is working and that's the problem is that i wasn't seeing the lights on the yeti the first time through and now i am all right so, we won't complain about only seeing you're gonna it. spend 200 hours in a friggin microphone you ought to use it all right thank we won't, you all. we won't complain about seeing only half your face <laughs> take it away john thank you all welcome all right, so tax office support, uh, unlike others who are charging $500 a month, $147 a month uh, gets you a 90-minute call every Friday all year round. During tax season, you can pick up uh, an extra two hours on Friday on uh, Wednesday nights. The Wednesday night uh, person assisting me rotates between Mark Dombrowski, Jessica Smith, and Rita Ryan. Uh, Rita also helps us with all of our international questions that you may have. So by all means, let me know. We have a few seats left. Real estate begins next month. Uh, this is our listing of classes. We open up with AJ Reynolds on August 3rd. He'll be doing a class that's completely free. If you have friends who want to sample what we're doing, see what our programs are like, by all means, invite them, please, to come to that class. It'll be great to have them. Oh, so, uh, and a quick mention, speakers are um, AJ, Kathy Morgan is back with uh, three or four of the programs. Mark is in on releasing liens and during real estate transactions. Amy Wall Street is going to come back and be Amy Main Street, I guess, as she talks about real estate. Brian Coddington on Form 3115, he is basically our, our god on, on those issues. And then uh, somehow I have a program or two as well. So please consider joining us next month. Registration remains open for the IRS National Forums. I do want to tell you that San Diego is sold out, they tell us. San Diego is sold out. So um, 
Don't plan on coming to San Diego. Uh, Commissioner Werfel was going to give the keynote address at Atlanta. I just want to, I'm going to mention this this one last time. Uh, I did hear uh, at a conference I was at two weeks ago that only 1,600 people have registered for the Atlanta Forum. And I commented that when uh, I was in Denver five or six years ago and they only had 1,600 or so people and they haven't been back. So I wonder if we're going to see Atlanta uh, go away and they'll look for another venue in the southeast. San Diego was sold out. National Harbor's hotel is that's DC area. That's the hotel's been sold out since May. I'm actually, um, you know, going to have to stay at the Westin. Poor me, but I will be there at National Harbor. So those of you that want to come to a mixer, Irina is coming. So yes, there will be a mixer. I'll get an email out or put something in Facebook, and we'll pick a pick a night. Uh, we should have a good group of people. I'm hearing that there's a lot of folks that'll be in town. Uh, also that live in the DC, Virginia area, you'd be welcome to come too. You don't nest. You don't need to be just attending the forum. By all means, come to the Mixer event as we put that together. August 8th, Frank Agostino, Federal Rules of Evidence in Tax Cases, Part 2. Uh, you come to the class in Hackensack, you get free pizza and Frank in person. Otherwise, you come online. We have hundreds of people online. It's been a huge success. So by all means, we, we run the program. It's run on Big Marker. We have our moderators in place. Uh, so by all means, join us. It's, it's a fabulous program. Three completely free CE or CPE, or if you're an attorney, there are New York and New Jersey um, attorney credits, COE credits offered by Frank's office. Our AFT, uh, our program is hopefully almost through IRS review, and that program is included if you're a subscriber. So if you have a staffer, you've been thinking about putting them on or not on, if you add them as a subscriber, they're going to pick up this program for free as well. The International Tax Conference is set for um, October 30th, 31st, and November 1st in New York City. By all means, join us, registration link, and we'll be happy to give you any information you need on the program. Yeah, this is where I live. This is uh, nearby. This is near West Point, an actual photo uh, disaster or declared disaster area. It's not great. I, I thought that's important, though. Uh, that didn't affect me. But it did affect a lot of folks in the area. The IRS has a webinar on the employee retention credit uh, coming up July 25th. It's two hours. Typically, these IRS free webinars have been one hour. I think that's great that it's two hours. The gentleman that's speaking on it is someone we heard both at Frank Agostito's uh, controversy forum and the NYU controversy forum. Fabulous IRS speaker, very knowledgeable. If you want to know what's going on at the IRS right now with respect to uh, examinations, this is the this is a um, this is a CE event you want to catch. It's free. It's two credits. All right. We've been saying COVID operations um, are, are running a little bit behind. So we've updated. These are, these numbers are through July 14th. Um, they're telling us the July 8th. Actually, it's through July 21st. And I'm giving you the July 14th numbers. Did I take the... Oops. Yeah, that the dates are wrong, but it's the correct, uh, it's the correct information. Uh, as we know, the IRS changed their main form um, back June 23rd. And their message is now that they're processing tax returns and payments and refunds and correspondence on time, but they continue to experience delays. So, all right. So numbers as of uh, today's numbers, but as of um, uh, July, uh, July 15th, 2.42 unpro uh, million unprocessed returns. They've decreased that by 580,000 in two weeks. They have 1.6 million in error correction. That's only down 100,000 in 15 days. So what's going on here? Well, uh, and they have 820,000 paper returns left with 480,000 decrease over two weeks, right? So what does this tell us? The IRS appears to be emphasizing getting rid of those paper returns, right? They, they doesn't look like they're making much movement in error correction. So all of these e-filed returns with errors aren't budging, but paper returns, they're popping out. 
There are 1.29 million amended returns, only down 6,000 in two weeks. I had to double check that number. Again, they're hardly touching these. 941 numbers um, are, it's, it, it should be 371. They're up 195,000 in two weeks. So what does this mean? This seems to suggest that right now, that, well, that's normal, that the, it's the end of the quarter. So that's normal. Those numbers are going up. 941X is at 374,000, up 68,000 amended returns in two weeks. Now, prior to uh, the end of the year, during tax season, the IRS was processing 20,000 of these a week between two service centers. Um, Commissioner Werfel said he would increase that number to 40,000 after tax season. And in fact, it's been higher than 40,000. It's been 60, 80 or more. This is the first increase we've seen since December. They've, they've been punching these things down. So one of two things, either the mills are ramping up again or the IRS has got resources pushed on paper returns getting out the door. It's not clear, but I'm, I'm speculating that the IRS is pushing on this. Now, this is my picture again. And these are grants. The grants are available for flood victims in this county. New York State made $3 million uh, in aid available. And it's available $50,000 per person. There's income restrictions. Now, you're saying to yourself, how many people do you have that listen to this program that are in Orange County? People that know you don't like you, right? So probably nobody is listening to me from here. So why am I telling you this? Your takeaways should be, that we have email and cell phone numbers for all of our clients in Drake. We export this frequently into MailChimp, which is our email system, and Textalent, which is our texting solution. So because these things are up and running and continuously updated, within an hour of the governor's announcement, we sent out emails and texts to everybody in the database. The pandemic should have taught you that you need these tools. You need to be ready to turn around on a moment's notice. I thought the phone's gonna blow up. There's only, in this zip code, there's only three practitioner numbers, right? Me, another EA, and a block office I used to own, ironically, that moved to this town. Um, block is closed, and you're gonna get the call center. I don't know if they would know what's going on in Orange County. So I said, my phone's gonna blow up between people looking for somebody who's open and people looking for information. We got the information out right away with a link to the application. What can we do to help you, right? Out it went. The only client contacts we've had were people texting back, thank you so much. So the phone didn't blow up. We had positive client contact. In fact, a few people texted and said, you know, I'm not near there. Oh, thank God I don't need this. Great way to be in communication with people. We got more responses from the texts than the emails and the social media postings, just, just for what it's worth. So if, if you're not doing this, you should. I think you should. Um, now, this is kind of funny. So uh, my daughter's financial aid, we got back a statement from, she got back a letter from the IRS, which says, hey, somebody had used the IRS data retrieval tool on FAFSA. And we knew that, she knew that. But the funny thing is, if you look at the lower left-hand corner, since they know they've got college students as a um, uh, as an audience, they said, by the way, scan this code if you're looking for a job at the IRS. So be inter maybe I'll do a FOIA request. It'd be interesting to find out how many people scanned that, right? All right. Interesting article in Bloomberg this week, and I'm putting this in here because it affects our industry, I think. So job listings for remote control are for remote jobs are in hot demand. It seems that these positions disappear from job boards within 48 to 72 hours, probably because they're oversubscribed. The article goes on to cite a few where small firms got 10,000 replies. So LinkedIn has some, no, LinkedIn, of course, you know who they are, and they, they've been around, what, 20 years? So if they give you numbers, I think their systems are pretty solid. So LinkedIn said in May, 11% of the job listings posted to LinkedIn offered fully remote positions. 50% of the applications on the website 
went to those 11% of the jobs. These things are in hot demand. Seems there's now an industry of career coaches. Everybody's a coach these days. There's an industry of career coaches that for $3,000 help you find a fully work from home job. For 300 bucks, you can get yourself some one-off coaching. That's a pretty good gig. IRS announced the health savings account limits for 2024. As you can see, reasonable increases from 23 to 24. No change in catch-up contributions at all. Out-of-pocket maximums increased as well on the bottom. And I figured this is just for planning purposes. Now, this is interesting. And I put a copy of this white paper in with the handout. So some of you, I think, have tax file for free through NAEA or other organizations. Uh, so tax files portal system, they've added an AI. Again, I'm unclear if this is included or a separate purchase. I'd imagine it's a separate purchase. But this AI is using optical character recognition to digitize the prior year tax return. They're breaking it down into data points and they are using the data from last year's tax return to create a document request list for the current year. How brilliant is that? You know, and then if you could merge that in to do something like Tax Dome does where it's gonna go back and forth and collect it, this, this might be the next killer app in our profession. Um, it's gonna generate, this is gonna generate this list they're claiming that their AI will also monitor chats that are going on inside the uh, tool between you and the client and, and update accordingly. So this is going to be interesting to see what happens. Uh, oh, yeah. F FEMA, may, uh, Henry's making an interesting uh, point that maybe FEMA has taken over some of our employees. I thought they only affect the call center, Henry. Right, they only affect optional things, and answering the phone is optional. Don't know. All right, so I thought I'd pop this up. I, I'd like to give you fraud cases here and there. So Christopher Harrison in Fayetteville got 18 months in prison. He pled guilty to um, taking 25 million dollars and not reporting it that he stole from uh, his business. So what did he do? Well. He takes over this company called Even Concepts, which was a uh, human resources company, uh, probably, but I'm not sure. It was uh, an employee um, leasing company as well. He was the CFO and the majority owner. He started uh, spending company money for personal use in 2012. Sounds like most of my S-Corp owners. Uh, there was a 2011 bankruptcy, or there was a Chapter 11 bankruptcy proceeding. And during this, an accounting firm discovered the $25 million in expenses that were reported as business expenses. That's a lot of money. It's $4 million a year uh, in those six years. That's a lot of spending. Uh, so this conduct and the hiding of income and having a business pay personal expenses cheats all the Americans who pay their fair share and don't get caught. Yeah. This was another interesting Bloomberg bullet point because I, I can't make the math work. But um, I would save, if I made $650,000, I would save $258,000 to move to Austin. Okay, maybe. Go down to the bottom numbers. If I made $150,000 in New York, I would save $64,000 to remove to, to move to Austin. I don't know. I don't see it, but something to think about. Okay, so this was our guy Harrison. Why is he in here twice? IRS is making significant strides in modernization and service improvement efforts. They have a number of new initiatives, as we know, with digital tools. Key enhancements to tax professional online or account are underway. One of them is going to be that it works, right? It works 100% of the time. They're working on account authorization management and payment viewing. These are both supposed to deploy by the end of the third quarter. They're trying to put in live chat and secure two-way messaging during fiscal year 2024. Well, that starts October. Uh, fiscal year 2024 would start uh, in over a year, right? Because in October, we're going to start the 23-24 year. So that's a ways away. Uh, I didn't have anything to post on it, but 
uh, when I was at Latino Tax Fest, uh, the IRS was there with one of their vendors uh, talking about this new AI tool they have. And this is where I think killer apps start to come in. So they have an AI tool that will ride on top of the IRS website as a chatbot. The only, it, its universe of responses aren't the whole internet and like chat GPT, some version of data through two years ago. It's only going to be able to look at what's currently on the IRS website. So they had it in beta and they were playing with it. And we can't see the beta. So he says, so do you have anything you'd want to ask? I said, yeah, actually, I said, you put out a great set of um, FAQs on 1099K last December. The guy shook his head. I said, and then last month, you've got this other web page of 1099K information. And if I said 1099Q before I meant 1099K, I said, and the two, they've got a lot of the same information, but I don't understand why they're both there. I'd love to know which one this is going to bring up. So we typed in, how do I report form 1099K on my tax return? That was the question. And what did it do? It brought up 1099K PDF and an explanation of how to complete a 1099K. And the vendor said, you don't look like that's the answer you wanted. I explained to him what 1099K was. I guess they're going to go back to the drawing board. But it was an interest, And they did take my name. So I don't know if that's good or bad. So that was an interesting conversation. What's going on out there? So um, with the new funding in the Inflation Reduction Act, the IRS is spending the money and looking at tech modernization. That's what they're supposed to do with the money. I just told you about the AI tool they're looking at. Um, and they're also thinking AI is going to be used to scan and extract data from paper documents. Maybe it is, and maybe that's how we're receiving stuff, uh, how they're processing some of it so quickly. I previously reported that they were using an AI tool on Form 940, and that's why they increased the number of um, electronically filed uh, 940s by 800%. The tool scans, it, scans the 940, makes it into a data file that the IRS can then e-file to itself. No data entry, no porting over, uh, probably a good use of their time and, and resources. So um, Kashit Pandaya Panday was talking about the agency's plans and some of the early concepts of AI. And um, the IRS intends to redefine and rectify some of these models over the next year to tackle potential issues and perfect their systems. So again, not, not telling us anything that, that they're going to release. So you might remember that we have a law about um, using this book income tax, right? Book to income tax. So the IRS disclosed this week that they're considering issuing more guidance on the book to income tax prior to release of formal regulations. The IRS already provided two different notices of preliminary guidance on the corporate alternative minimum tax. And the corporate alternative minimum tax says that large profitable companies have to pay taxes at a minimum rate of 15% on their adjusted financial statement income. So if you remember GE in the early 2000s, right? GE would post record profits of a billion dollars, pay no federal income tax. So that, that juxtaposition is supposed to be resolved here a little bit that if your accounting income is a billion dollars, you should pay in at least $150 million in tax. And, and that's where they're headed. I don't think that affects the majority of our customers, but file that under the if they should ask. And then um, hopefully further uh, guidance is forthcoming. We have a temporary reprieve on 401k payments. So if you've been following what's going on here, um, we have a change in dates about when um, RMDs are going to be due. So for folks born in 1951, the guidance wasn't exactly correct prior to July 31st. So now we have some transitional relief while the IRS figures out what they want to do here. You'll recall that Secure 2.0, passed by Congress, increased the RMD age to 73 in 2023, with an increase to age 75 starting in 2033. You'll also remember, not mentioned here, Secure 1, for want of a better term, raised the age from 70 and a half to 73. So we kind of very quickly win here. They probably should have dropped the whole 73 idea. Current guidance provides regulatory and penalty relief 
for RMDs that have not been made to beneficiaries uh, when participants in the plan have passed away. So they, they gave us some relief here as well. I don't want to bore you with this, but we've had this vexing problem in the international world ever since uh, 965, right? The transition tax was passed as part of the Tax Cut and Job Act. So the question is, previously taxed earnings and profits. Under Section 986C, right, um, what happens when there's an exchange rate change and we have a loss due to the exchange rate? So the IRS is supposed to clarify how foreign exchange rules are going to apply when a controlled foreign corporation, a controlled foreign corporation is when uh, five or less Americans own more than 50% of a foreign corporation, a corporation organized outside the United States. So if we have previously taxed earnings and profits from a lower tier corporation that uses a different functional currency, what do we do with that gain or loss? Does that end up getting reported on our return or not? And if you're a large enough entity that you've got uh, nested corporations, a foreign corp with a foreign subsidiary, this, this is something that, that you're going to be concerned with. And certainly if they operate in different currencies, you are more likely than not going to have realized gain or loss in moving money between the entities. So Congress was away for two weeks and, and now they're back this week. They're back here for three weeks and then they go on vacation until after Labor Day. So they've identified, both parties have identified a couple of priorities that need to get worked on. The appropriation bills, right? October 1st, we have a new budget coming in. They have to approve the money. The National Defense Authorization Act, NDAA, which is something that they frequently pin things to because everybody can agree we need to be able to blow people up. So they pass this act. Uh, still on everybody's agenda, decreasing prescription drugs, getting a control on insulin prices. Uh, China competition legislation, or CHIPS 2.0, they're calling it. And then um, Senator Schumer, who was majority leader, now minority leader in the Senate, uh, is the fan of cannabis banking. He said he was going to get it done this year. So let's see if he gets it done. And, and what they're going to do is they're going to say that a fully compliant marijuana business that's licensed under state law will be able to access the banks. The banks will not have a prohibition in taking those deposits, which they do right now, generally speaking. Uh, speaking of Senator Schumer, um, he has some aspirations for work. He put out a letter on July 9th. I gave you a copy of it, nothing earth shattering in it, but it was available. Given the limited time they have here, it's, it's unsure if they're gonna get anything done or what they'll get done, but they have to set these goals. They don't think, the, the pundits don't think that we're going to see tax legislation. Remember the Republicans passed, uh, put together a package. We don't think we're going to see that before the August recess. But both sides want one or the other uh, thing. We're going to talk about that, but you probably already know from previous classes. Republicans would like to see immediate expensing of research and development again, and maybe some movement on the 463J interest deduction limitation. And um, the Democrats would certainly like to see an expanded earned income credit and an expanded and permanent child tax credit with an advanced payment because they use those advanced payment numbers as part of household income to argue how many families and how many children they've moved out of poverty. So there's an impetus on both sides to, to see these things get passed. So does that mean we get a deal? Maybe. Okay, so the House bill... Uh, was released in June, includes $11.2 billion for the IRS, a $1.1 billion cut, and a rescission of $10.2 billion in IRS funds um, previously allocated. So $10.2 out of the $80 billion. You'll remember that this was part of the debt limit deal, right? They passed, they, they said, we know how much money we're going to spend in various departments. You, IRS, you're giving up a big piece of your increase. And you're going to give up a big piece of your money moving forward. In fact, there's $10 billion more uh, to come because they agreed to a $20 billion cut from $80 to $60 billion. Now, uh, the Senate side, they passed with a 29 to 0 vote, uh, has IRS funding of $12.3 billion, 
which was the initial amount in the budget. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens here, who gets what and how much money they get. Uh, I do know that that proposed cut that they made or that they tentatively agreed to as part of the uh, debt ceiling meant the IRS have have a hiring freeze because when you consider union requirements, training requirements, and background check requirements, you have to employ somebody for three years if you bring them on even as a temp. So that that froze their uh, froze their hiring. All right, Republican priority shift that they think is that uh, Steve Scalise from Louisiana, who's the House Majority Leader, has confirmed that the House doesn't want to vote on the Ways and Means Committee tax package. Uh, the appropriations bills and the NDAA are going to be prioritized. Um, the tax package, though, was passed out of committee in June, faces challenges within the Republican uh, conference. Well, of course, if they bring up um, research and development, immediate expensing, and or the 463J, I think we're going to see that change. So on the House, um, on the uh, House Ways and Means side, uh, Jason uh, Jason Smith of Missouri chairs this. They've got that increase in the standard deduction. They're calling that bon that four thousand dollar bonus deduction. They want this in place ahead of Tax Cut and Job Act phasing out. They don't want people itemizing. So they want to increase the standard deduction by four thousand dollars. It's going to happen for at least two years. It's already in there. They want to repeal all the energy credits from the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, but the package, of course, is being criticized by California and New York members because they don't have a salt cap. They're not, they're not uh, increasing the salt cap or removing it. So we'll see what happens here. Both sides, though, want to see the packages move. So we'll see what deals they cut. I mentioned this without reading it. Um, if they get to a consensus, the last bullet point is the FAA has a reauthorization act. They have to reauthorize like every five years. And so that we could see some of these things get attached to that. Uh, they could get attached to the budget. Or that CHIPS 2.0 U.S. competitiveness bill right with China, you could see it attached to that. So there are three big pieces of legislation coming, four if you count the NDAA. So we'll, we'll see where this goes. You've probably seen this whole thing with me, with Meta Facebook, right? With sharing of data. So Elizabeth Warren has called for an investigation. She has a 50 some odd page report on this. I gave you a copy. So um, the article is called Attacks on Tax Privacy, How the Tax Prep Industry Enabled Meta. Meta. Um, no clue though. One of the things that bothers me is that we don't know what data is being shared. You know, if we're not sharing um, PII, personal identifiable information, I mean, if you're passing along the, a thing that says uh, that I'm a white male in New York, uh, age 56, not 56, with uh, $200,000 of AGI, if it didn't identify me, I'm just, you got to read 7216 of the Graham Leach Biley Act. You know, there are exceptions that allow you to compile data for statistical purposes. So it'll be interesting to see where this goes and what they really have here. So 54 page report, I think I misquoted that. Um, Google, Meta, uh, the tax prep firms are all defending their practices. Uh, I don't know that you can say it's common procedure, right? But if they are ensuring taxpayer privacy and it's legal, not much they should be able to do about this. IRS has been showing service improvements during the recent season. Uh, we don't know about their digital advancements. Uh, I don't know about you. Reports I hear from our colleagues are that 50% or so of the time, that taxpayer portal, that instant POA seems to work, sometimes on our end, sometimes on their end. I will tell you from personal experience, um, a lot of our rep clients are actually accessing their own transcripts. Nicole had a concept uh, conversation with someone the other day where we didn't do the return. We're just doing collection work. And we mentioned to her that the 2022 return wasn't on the transcript yet because she assured us it was filed and we had faxed a copy into ACS. And the woman said, yeah, I was looking at my transcript yesterday and I didn't see it either. So what's up with that, right? Being able to go in and look at your own transcript. That's a couple of folks. Uh, we had somebody else too where I told them their bill was going to be $32 because I had a penalty removed. 
And he had said, well, it's $532. I said, just, just pay the $32. They're going to take the $500 off. Um, yeah, Ellie is saying she had no weight every day when she called the IRS. Yeah, yeah POAs, um, POAs are coming up fast, but I have other POAs that just aren't posting at all, and it's frustrating. You know, you, have, you send in 10, and three of them post in a day, and the others never post. All right, so those of you that do uh, a lot of, um, if you're Matt Metris or um, uh, Knox Wimberly, this is for you. So the IRS is calling and Congress is calling for input on digital asset tax policy. So Ron Wyden of Oregon and uh, Mike Crapo, I love that name from Idaho, are looking for input from cryptocurrency industry experts and observers. They're looking to better understand the tax challenges and opportunities. Now, where were they in 2009 and 2010 when we had no guidance at all? And now they want to talk to you about important things like mark to market, <laughs> uh, a trading safe harbor, I guess, um, treatment of loans of digital assets, right? Stay, uh, staking income, wash sales, constructive receipt and timing. Boy, Congress wants to get a wash sale rule in there so bad they can taste it. Um, Constructive sales. Remember, we have that case out there, that Jarrett case, where uh, they're arguing that they don't have a taxable event if they if they are rewarded a, co a Tezos coin. They were rewarded if they're rewarded a coin that it's not income until they sell it and actually get money for it, not when it's created. So that would be very interesting to see. Um, be very interesting to see um, where where this goes. Henry is saying, check the contributor list. Yeah, I wonder if Samuel Bankman Fried would have had a seat at this table had he not um, uh, got kicked out of Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah. All right. So non functional currency, FATCA and F bar are always an issue that we've considered. Um, you know, valuation. Well, there's always valuation. These things trade twenty four seven. So they're taking uh, responses up until September eighth. If you or one of your friends would like to uh, give them a response. So National Defense um, Authorization Act, number of things in here. Brian Fitzpatrick proposed an amendment to make the first $100,000 of income tax free and to make $100,000 of student loans um, forgiven for five years. So this could be interesting. That would leave nobody paying income tax. Um Jimmy Peretta of California, Greg Stube of Florida uh, have suggested it proposed an amendment to require the Department of Defense to notify service members about the free Militax program and other tax programs offered during the first two months of the year. Well, why not? They can put it right on the leave and earnings statements if the if uh, Intuit can put their logo on my on W2s we generate. Why can't they do that? So, um, Mr. Werfel, our uh, commissioner, is encouraging whistleblower reports. He's encouraging this internally, and he made a couple of comments to folks, basically, that they can send reports directly to the Office of Special Counsel if they fear retribution or don't want to go through the normal channels, and that's understandable. So, this is, this is just interesting where this will go and why they've needed to say that. We often uh, ask what happens to people and, and why doesn't the government go after somebody? Well, this is a Las Vegas tax preparer, Martha Williams, who she's in the news this week. But interestingly, she was convicted or pled guilty, I should say, two years ago. She pled guilty, uh, pled guilty in 2020, sentenced, sentenced in 2021 to two years at Club Fed for inflating deductions on 1040 returns, right? Making up businesses, the usual stuff, a big Schedule A, a loss on a Schedule C. Uh, so why do we care? Well, if you remember from our days with uh, Karen Hawkins, when Karen had the RTRP program out there and was looking to um, uh, regulate everybody, they had aggressively disbarred people. They took away P-tins from people. And when they lost Loving versus Commissioner, one of the things that Mrs. Hawkins said in an interview was that there were some folks that they were probably going to have to give P-tins back to because Loving tells us that practice before the IRS as per that can be regulated by Circular 230 does not include the preparation of tax returns. 
Ooh. So what happens? So she has an injunction. So the only way to stop someone from doing a tax return, by the way, is to get an injunction against them. Now, I don't know what good this does. Three years after they stopped her and after she's been to prison, they have an injunction. But um, this prohibited her from preparing and filing returns. She's barred from employing anyone. She can't have an interest in a business. And she has to stop any operation she has within 30 days. She's prohibited from possessing a P-tin or an EFIN. I would have thought with a felony conviction, they would take the EFIN away and that they would flag that during suitability, but I don't know. She has to contact everybody that she prepared a return or assisted a return for in the last three years uh, and inform them of the injunction. Something tells me Pam is saying in the chat that I know Pam is in Las Vegas. She had a few of these clients. I, I don't, I'm sure once quote unquote, everybody got audited, she had no clients left. Um, so the U.S. has a right to conduct discovery and monitor compliance. So in other words, she's agreed to this, that they can summons her and she won't fight it. Um, and the court will continue to have injunction, uh, uh, have jurisdiction over this case while it's open. So very interesting stuff to me. And yeah, they go after people. And yes, they take away petons. All right. I'm adding a new feature this week called Beware of Bad Advice. It's, it's actually going to be called Bad Advice of the Week. So I'm going to give you this week's bad advice. And then I want you, as you see TikTok, memes, and other videos out there, send me a link to the video because we'd really be excited to see that video. Um, they didn't put my video here. This is terrible. Hang on. All right, so this is this week's bad advice. Here's a tax loophole that influencers use to save millions on taxes. And the IRS definitely doesn't want you to know about this one. It's called Section 162A, and it allows you to write off anything that you use in your content as a necessary and ordinary business expense. And since influencers have a personal brand, they're able to write off many personal things that normal businesses can't. For example, luxury cars, watches, clothing, and other personal items that would usually be considered owner's pay or a draw that would normally be taxed are now able to be written off against your income so if you want to save money on taxes you might want to consider creating some content man that's week's bit that that is this week's bad advice and uh neither i don't need to tell you that the irs disagrees after ordinary and necessary they disagree with the balance of this video and what was really funny is this is a video that was used in one of the enforcement uh, i had to go find it but this is a video that was used in one of the forums so, you know, if if Irish Criminal Investigation Division is saying, yeah, this is the kind of advice that's out there, man, CID did see it. That's where I saw it from. And you wouldn't believe how many of these videos are out there from the half wrong to the completely wrong to the completely ridiculous. Yeah. Oh, I thought it would go back to my. Ah, uh, there we are. Ah, uh, there we go. Hey, so um, if you're not a subscriber, you should become one. Uh, Carlene, do you? I'm going to add a line. You want to take advantage of advice you got from TikTok on my onboarding meeting so that I can stop the interview and say we're not a good fit. You know what I always think is funny? We were talking about pricing at, at another uh, another conference where I was uh, on, a, on a panel. And I said, you know, there's that old joke about, you know, the guy across the street, you, you, you do $20 haircuts, the guy across the street starts selling $10 haircuts. How do you compete on price? The answer is you put up a sign that says we fix $10 haircuts. So the same thing here, you know, we fix TikTok advice. I, I don't know what to tell you. Um, 
the other thought is that if that's that guy shouldn't uh shouldn't be my client anyway um that's me there's no other questions i guess so bad advice of the week please as you see this stuff i just think it's too funny so please send it along we'll we'll plug in 30 uh you know the 30 seconds of it and maybe we'll vote every at the end of the quarter or something on who gave us the best bad advice right and we'll We'll do something with that. So, yeah, they are on Facebook. I agree. Uh, so um, next week, I'm I'm in. If you're in San Diego, I want to do a mixer next week. Uh, send me an email. Let me know you're gonna if you're anywhere near San Diego. We're gonna try and do something. I think Tuesday night. Uh, thank you, Jeffrey. Um, we then uh, uh, I'm on vacation for two days. The end of next week, and then the following week, I will be in uh, D.C. at the forums. Same thing, we're going to do a mixer. So even if you're not at the forums, if you can get to National Harbor, come on over. We're going to put something together. Uh, just let me know you're going to be in town, all right? Everybody, but uh, see you next Friday on the following Friday. Everybody have a great weekend.